challenges and barriers for implementation of waste to energy in Indonesia, which will be delivered by our speakers, Associate Professor Muhammad Faisal Ibrahim from University Putra Malaysia, and Ari Bakhtiar, PhD from Research Center of Sustainable Energy ITS. And the lecture will be moderated by Dr. Ruri Agung from ITS. Okay, before we start our agenda, allow me to deliver our schedule today as follow. First, lecture from Associate Professor Muhammad Faisal. Second, lecture from Ari Bakhtiar PhD. And the third is Q&A session. The fourth is certificate awarding and the five is closing. And before we proceed to the lecture, let me introduce our moderator today. So today we have Dr. Ruri Agung as our moderator. She got his degree from engineering physic ITS and also University Jena, Germany. She has also some research in nanomaterial for energy application and many things. Okay, before we start our lecture, uh, and without further ado, let's proceed to the main agenda. To Dr. Ruli, the time is yours. Okay. Thanks, Mbak Aulia, for the nice introductions about me. Uh, is everybody listening to my voice clearly or? Yes, very clear. Okay, that's great. Thank you. So. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, as already introduced by the Master of Ceremony, I am Ruri Wahyono from the uh, Department of Engineering and Physics from ITS Surabaya. And uh, in this occasion, I will chair today's Global Lecture Series on the Sustainable Development Goals organized by the ITS Global Engagement. Uh, it's also an, uh, an honor for me uh, to welcome uh, the two invited speakers from to, for today's afternoon lecture, Professor Muhammad Faisal Ibrahim from University Putra Malaysia and Dr. Ali Bahtiar from the ITS Research Center for Sustainable Energy. So if I may add a little bit information are also part of ITS efforts to increase awareness to the society concerning the 17 Sustainable Development Goals yeah, to, uh, to support uh, the 2030 Agenda of, of Sustainable Developments. And before we begin uh, today's lecture, I'd like to again emphasize a little bit uh, directions to our invited speakers and participants that already mentioned actually by the, uh, the Master of Ceremony that the lecture will be given in 45 minutes. Uh, I, hope, I hope you can end your lecture shortly. And the, the participants may ask questions through the link given by the committee and also through the chat box or raise your hand later after the second lecture ends. And the committee will allow you to speak and ask questions. So to make it short, I'd like to uh, first introduce the first speaker, Dr. Muhammad Faisal Ibrahim from the University of Malaysia. Uh, Dr. Faisal Ibrahim earned his dip, uh, diploma, or diploma of Science in Biology from University Technology Mara. And also uh, he earned Bachelor of Science in Biotechnology from University Putra Malaysia, and at the same university, he obtained his PhD in environmental engineering. Uh, and Dr. Faisal's research interest in enzymes and biomass, and also Dr. Faisal received several awards, to name a few. You can also see in the screen uh, that Dr. Faisal uh, received Anugrah Penerbitan Platinum by Malaysian Palm Oil Board in. 2018, and then top three uh, age index, I guess it's by Scopus, and citations by the Faculty of uh, Biotechnology and Biomolecular Science from University Putra Malaysia in 2019, and, and top three number of publications as corresponding author uh, from the same faculty in 2019. Okay, so this afternoon, Dr. Faisal will give his lecture about from biomass to biofuels, what's inside. And we are looking forward to your lecture. So Dr. Faisal, you may start your lecture. Oh. 
right. Control okay. file is still <laughs> because it's control. Ah, okay, control. that's great. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot unmute. <argue. laughs> yeah. uh, first of all, yeah. thank you very much to Dr. Ruri for the uh, welcoming remarks to uh, just now. Uh, introduction about me just now, and uh, before I proceed, I would like to share my screen. But I need the permission by the host. Okay, I guess we need to get the permission from the committee to allow Dr. Faisal to share his screen. So probably Puna Stiti, oh, right. who is the host now? Ding now. <coughs> ah, yeah, that's great. Okay. All right. So again, thank you very much, Dr. Ruri, for the uh, warm introduction just now. Uh, before I proceed, I would like to say thank you very much for invitation by the international uh, by the Institute Technology School of November, uh, Surabaya, Indonesia. I have been there one time, but not uh, the nearby campus, which is the Elanga uh, in 2019, if I'm not mistaken. So thank you very much for inviting for this session, guest lecture series on sustainable development goals. And as mentioned by uh, the moderator just now, today I'm going to present or share uh, some of the information, some of the progress, uh, some of the research related to the uh, biomass to biofuels, what's inside. And my name is Muhammad Faisal B. Ibrahim from uh, University Putra Malaysia. All right, uh, so as for the introduction part, uh, let me see what is the uh, biomass. All right, so everybody know that we are growing uh, plants material uh, as our foods and for our consumption. And in order to grow the plant materials is undergo the photosynthesis process and taking the energy from the sun. So this is the soil energies uh, given to the earth and growing the plants material. And this plant material, we use it for the human consumptions as well as it's been used by the animal farming for us to consume as well. So by having this particular activity, all right, so there will have some residues left over from the plants materials and some residues uh, produced by the animals as well as we consume everyday foods. We produce some leftover from our activities, which is the human residues as well. And those things are considered as the biomass, which is the biological material that still consists some amount of energy originated from the sun that we can utilize it to be converted into the other form of energy. All right, so that's the biomass to biofuel. So if we do not do anything with the biomass, what will happen to this particular biomass? They will undergo the natural degradation. However, if undergo the natural degradation, it will take long process in order to fully degrade this particular biomass. And somehow if it is not properly managed or properly disposed to the environment, it, will, it can cause uh, pollutions to the water, pollutions to the air, soils, and so on. But if we want to manage the particular biomass also, we will have some costs. We need to put in some costs in order to manage this uh, uh, biomass. Another one issues that are related to biofuels is that our major or our most dependent energy currently is mostly coming from the fossil fuel. It's either in the form of petroleum or coal and so on. But however, this fossil fuel is we are using it as our sole energy it will contribute to the productions of high amounts of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere and subsequently will contribute or will cause the climate changes and also subsequently will make the global warming, which is being the issues worldwide nowadays. Besides that, using this energy from the fossil fuels also, we will face with the uh, uh, we will have, uh, they will produce some toxic material and definitely can cause pollutions because it is not environmental friendly. And if we are keep on uh, going using these uh, particular types of energy, it is non-renewable soon or later, it will be depleting and finish uh, from the stocks. And to make sure the security of the energy, we can use the biomass to produce the biofuels. 
and that will become part of the sustainable road in order to make sure that the energy is uh, secured for our future generation. And if you are using the biofuel, the most advantage is definitely it is environmental friendly, it is renewable because we are obtaining from the renewable material, which is the biomass, and by utilizing these biofuels as well, it can reduce the amounts of greenhouse gases produced into the atmosphere. All right, so what are types of biofuels that we can produce from biomass? So we have the biomass. In order to produce the biofuel, we must undergo the biological process. Biological process, mostly we know that biological process is the fermentation process. Later on, I will explain uh, in detail on how the biological process or fermentation process is being conducted in order to produce the biofuel. So this all are types of biofuel that can be produced from the biomass. We have biohydrogen, it is gas type, biomethane, or sometimes we call it as biogas. Bioethanol is very common or very uh, well known to, uh, as part of the, as one of the uh, biofuel. Uh, we also have biobutanol, and then uh, we also have biodiesels and also biocharcoal in the form of solid. So for today, most of the information of so most of the sharing research is related to the biobutanol as one of uh, as one of the type of biofuels, because this is uh, my experts in order to produce uh, the the biobutanol. Okay. All right, uh, before you proceed uh, to the detail on the fermentation types on how to produce the biofuel from biomass, let me see on the availabilities of biomass. So this is the amount of projected annual biomass availability in, Mal in Malaysia. So if you can see from here, most of the biomass produced are coming from the oil palm uh, biomass, oil palm industry. Palm oil industry, which producing uh, mostly oil palm front. Uh, we have the second one, oil palm empty food bunch. Then we have oil palm trunk, also oil palm canal shell. Besides that, the industries in Malaysia also, the agricultural industries in Malaysia also in the uh, rice production. So we have the leftover from these particular industries, which is the rice straw and also rice husk. Uh, forestry industries that will generate that generating uh, the waste which is uh, wood residues and definitely from our daily activities we are producing a lot of municipal solid waste uh, as part of the biomass generated in Malaysia. Okay, so since uh, palm oil industries uh, is the major uh, producer of the biomass in Malaysia, so let me check on how these biomass are being generated uh, from these particular industries. So this is the plantation area, the plantations of this uh, agricultural, uh, of this uh, palm oil industry. And then we need to harvest the fruits. After we harvest the fruit, we will collect it and we transport it to the mill. And at the mill where the process uh, is being conducted in order to obtain uh, the crude palm oil as the major product. So this is the uh, mass balance of these uh, of the processings of uh, palm oil industries. So we have the plantation area. We have the palm oil plantation. So this is whereby it involves the uh, input of the chemical. Uh, it involves the input of. I can see the slides. It involves the inputs of chemicals and uh, energies as well. And definitely uh, from these particular activities, we are taking the fresh fruit bunch in order to process it to produce uh, the main product, which is crude palm oil and also subsequent product, which is the canal. So by having these particular activities, it will generate the other byproducts, which is the excess steam. Uh, we also have the liquid biomass, which is the major uh, uh, waste are being generated from this particular industry, which is palm oil meal effluent, and the solid biomass, which is oil palm and food bunch and oil palm canal shell. And from the activities of the plantation, we are producing oil palm trunk, uh, oil palm trunk and also oil palm front. All right, so these all are the biomass generated from the activities of uh, producing the palm oil from this palm oil industry. So how much are being generated yearly? So this is the amount of uh, oil palm biomass are generated uh, in Malaysia 2010 and it 
keep on increasing uh, for 2015 as well as for 2020. All right, so definitely why we are using this particular biomass because the chemical compositions of this uh, oil palm biomass allow us to utilize it. It composes of cellulose and hemicellulose, which is the polysaccharides that we can digest it and convert it into the sugars, all right? So the composition, all of them are consisting of uh, uh, significant amounts of cellulose and hemicellulose, but usually in order for us to produce the biofuels from this biomass, we are using the oil palm and food bunch because the structures of this particular material are much more easier in order to be digested uh, to produce the sugar. All right, so the first biofuels uh, that I would like to share with you uh, is on the biogas production. All right, so this biogas production has been done by our research group as well up to the commercialization part. So this is the traditional treatments of palm oil meat refluent. So usually in the palm oil industries, they are using the ponding system. All right, the normal, the traditional one, they are using the ponding system. However, by conducting this particular, particular uh, treatment system, it will produce the methane gas and release it to the atmosphere. So then uh, they start develop or upgrade the technology to capture this uh, methane gas and uh, get it and burn it in order to convert it into the energy. And the latest technology under our uh, research group as well. So we are using, we are produce, we are develop the closed anaerobic digester, whereby the pump are being treated in this particular anaerobic digester, producing the methane gas, and uh, using that one to produce the energy or electricity for the mill operation. And if they have excess energy, then it will put into the grid, national grid. So basically the biomethane or biogas productions is used to treat the palm oil mill effluent. It is used to substitute ponding treatment system into anaerobic digesting system. The capacity that we develop in this particular mill achieve up to 3,600 meter cube, capture methane production, and then we use that methane in order to generate the electricity for the mill operation. And definitely we are counting the amounts of carbon dioxide reduced uh, by having this particular system. And we claim that one as part of the clean development mechanism. <clears throat> Another biofuels that can be produced from the biomass is the biohydrogen production. So why biohydrogen? Because biohydrogen uh, has about uh, 2.75 times higher energy yield than fuels derived from petroleum. It is low density, diffuses faster through the air, and it is totally non-toxic. Eh? If you burn the hydrogen, it will produce only water. All right, so this is the characteristics of the hydrogen. And the research that have been done to produce uh, this biohydrogen, one of it is biohydrogen production from sago biomass. Sago is a type of the agricultural industries in Malaysia, mostly in the Borneo, near to the Sarawak area, uh, Sarawak state. And this sago biomass uh, will produce the, uh, the sago industry produce the sago biomass in the form of sago hampas. Uh, the name called is sago hampas. Sago hampas is actually left over from this uh, industry, still consists about 50% of starch and the remaining 50% is cellulosic biomass. So if we hydrolyze this uh, sago hampas using the amylase, it will, we will obtain uh, glucose or sago hampas hydrolysate containing mostly glucose. And the remaining from this process is sago pit residue, which is uh, the composition, uh, the lignocellulosic components. In order to digest these uh, sago pit residues, we need the enzymes for cellulase. And then this digestion of sago pit residue will produce the sago pit residues hydrolysates containing mixtures of sugars. All right, so conducting the fermentation process by introducing the microorganism, then we can produce the uh, biohydrogen. <clears throat> so some of the research have been done in order to produce biohydrogen in our research is the biohydrogen fermentation by our locally isolated strains, which is Clostridium botulicum EB6. We have tested four different kinds of the substrates, for example, palm oil milk effluent, uh, tested for the sago hampas hydrolysate, tested for the sago pit residues, and also oil palm and trifurbans. And these are the amounts of the uh, biohydrogen that has been produced. 
the next one, the next biofuel, which is quite very common because it has been produced up to the commercial level to several countries, including Thailand, Brazil, US, China, even China, and so on, uh, is the bioethanol. So bioethanol also can be produced by the biomass. So previously, we are producing bioethanol from uh, the food material starch from the food material, for example, corn, tapioca, and so on. But now we go for the second generations of the biofuel production using the biomass. So in order to produce bioethanol uh, from biomass, we need to conduct some pretreatment process to pretreat the biomass and then conduct the hydrolysis process of the uh, hydrolysis of the polysaccharide material inside the biomass in order to produce the sugar or specifically glucose and use that glucose uh, for the fermentation process in order to produce the ethanol. <clears throat> so this is some of the research that have been done but long time ago uh, and now currently we, uh, we conduct the research for bioethanol more on the life cycle assessment analysis on economic uh, perspective for the bioethanol production but in terms of the fermentation or bioprocess to produce bioethanol, these are the substrates that has been tested, which is including the rice straw, the sago hampas, the oil palm and fruit bunch, and uh, they're producing these particular amounts of uh, bioethanol. <clears throat> and uh, move on to the very uh, specific uh, uh, informations about today from the biomass to the biofuels, which is I focus on the biobotanol. But most likely, although this is uh, specific for the biobotanol, but in order to produce biofuel, it will involve almost similar uh, uh, processing steps uh, in order to convert the biomass to the biobotanol. So, why we are producing the biobotanol as part of the biofuels? Because of the uh, advantages in terms of the characteristics of the biobotanol itself. Because why? Biobutanol has almost similar characteristics with gasoline. It is less corrosive, low vapor pressure, high energy content as compared to the gasoline, better adapted in the present distribution system. And we can use directly this biobutanol in cast engine without any modification. Or if we don't use this particular butanol for as a biofuels, this biobutanol also very demanding as part of the solvents for the manufacturing activities uh, to produce many types of uh, products. <clears throat> so in order to produce biobutanol, uh, through the biological process, we can use the fermentation process called ABE. What is ABE? ABE is acetone butanol ethanol fermentation process. And this fermentation process can be done by using the microorganisms, mostly close redeem species. All right, so uh, this close redeem species is capable to consume both hexose and pentose sugars, which is uh, these types of sugars are being released by the degradations or sacrifications of cellulosic biomass. Uh, it will produce the hexose and pentose, so it gives advantage if we are using the crossfeeding species because it can consume both hexose and pentose sugar. And the product produced from these ABE fermentations are the solvents, which are the acetone, butanol, ethanol at the ratios of usually 3 to 6 to 1. So the major compounds or the major compositions of the solvent being produced are butanol. Besides that, it is also produced acids, which are the acetic and also butyric acid and uh, the gases, which is the carbon dioxide and hydrogen. The metabolic pathway for this particular ABE fermentation is biphasic fermentation, whereby it undergo two separate phases, which is acidogenesis, that majorly producing the acetic acids and butyric acids, and then shift to the solventogenesis acids, that basically producing the solvent spike. <clears throat> Okay, so some of the, the following information have been published uh, in these two uh, publications, Advanced Bioprocessing Strategies for Biobutanol Production from Biomass, as well as Cellulosic Biobutanol by Crosslidia Challenges and Improvement. <clears throat> So in order to produce uh, biobutanol from biomass, there are several types. There are three major types of biomass that we can utilize in order to produce biobutanol. The first one is starch biomass. Yeah? Uh, we don't use the foods, but it's left over from the processing of uh, starch material. So this starch biomass, the major advantages 
are it is simple and fast saccharification process. Uh, using SAS biomass, we require less than 24 hours in order to convert it into the fermentable sugars. Another one, uh, to do the saccharification process, we are using a very cheap amylase uh, and we will obtain a very high sugar conversion yield. And definitely we don't need any treatment process and there will be no inhibitory compound release from uh, the saccharifications of starch biomass to the sugars. And we can also directly utilize the starch biomass to produce the bioethanol. However, the major disadvantages of this particular biomass, it is we have limited resource of starch uh, waste. Uh, it is not as much as compared to the other types of biomass, especially lignocellulosic biomass. And usually in the processing of starch uh, material, uh, it will involve uh, the starch waste usually will mix with the huge amount of water. <clears throat> Another types of biomass, which is the lignocellulosic biomass, the solely uh, advantages of this particular biomass is it is the most abundant material. Uh, we have a lot of this particular biomass, uh, quite very abundant, uh, uh, produced from our agricultural industry, forestry, and so on. But however, this biomass mostly requires harsh pre-treatment process. Uh, it is expensive. If we want to use this linoceus biomass, we require cellulose, which is quite expensive in order to convert this uh, to the sugar. And if we do the saccharification process or some treatment process of linoceus biomass, it will generate some inhibitory compound. Uh, saccharification process also will produce mixture of sugars, as I mentioned to you just now, like pentose and hexo sugars. And uh, it will be very difficult to directly convert this linoceus biomass to butanol. Another type of biomass is the algae biomass. So usually the algae biomass, uh, uh, we are using this algae biomass in order to obtain the oil for the biodiesel production. So extracting the oil from the algae biomass will have some leftover, all right? So this uh, particular leftover is usually the polysaccharide material that we can subsequently do some pre-treatment and hydrolysis process in order to produce sugar for us to produce the biobutanol or other types of biofuels. So the advantages of algae biomass, it is simple and fast growth. Uh, carbon dioxide physician means that we can uh, fix the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and reduce the amounts of uh, this uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by conducting these, uh, pro the productions of algae. Uh, not competing with land or not competing land with food crop and composed of high amounts of lipid and carbohydrate. Less hemicellulose and there will be no lignin. So if pre-treatment only a uh, very simple pre-treatment is required prior to the hydrolysis into the fermentable sugars. <clears throat> However, the major disadvantages is high cost for harvesting, drying, and extraction, additional process to ferment algae, high capital cost, and low biomass concentration. <clears throat> so this is the levels uh, or the steps in order to produce the biobutanol from the uh, biomass, uh, particularly the inoslosy biomass. So we need to have the pre-treatment process at the chemical, physical, or the biological process. And after that, we do the hydrolysis process at the enzymatic or acids in order to produce the sugars. Then we can use this sugar by conducting the fermentation process to produce the, the mixtures of solvents. Then we need to have the recovery process in order to uh, get the pure biobutanol. So by seeing this one, if we have this particular process throughout this process, we will require more materials, energy, and times, which is contribute to the operational cost. And definitely throughout this process, we should go for the product value, high product value. However, if the product value, for example, butanol is low as compared to the operational cost, then it is cannot meet the industrial perspective in order to produce these two for the industrial uh, use. <clears throat> So next on, we move to the challenges on biobutanol production from biomass. The first major challenges is uh, the high processing costs. These high processing costs are contributed by the amounts of enzyme used for the saccharification process, which is the cellulose that is very expensive. Uh, cost of the pre-treatment process doesn't matter what types of pre-treatment process. It requires a lot of energy, requires a lot of uh, 
uh, enzymes, we are using enzymes or chemicals, we are using the chemicals. And it's involved multiple processing steps, as I mentioned to you just now. This is contribute to the energy and time, cost of enzyme, as well as uh, some uh, challenges, which is low butanol uh, concentration being produced. Another challenge is the product inhibition, which is acid inhibition, as well as solvent inhibition. The next one is the strain capability. Uh, usually, the close screening species are strictly and oral, uh, possess complex metabolic pathway, toxic to the butanol, uh, is involved by phasic fermentation, which is acidogenesis and solventogenesis, as well as the forming spore in unfavorable condition. Another one of the challenges is uh, the multiple end product, uh, because when we conduct the ABE fermentation, it produces uh, gases, hydrogen and carbon dioxide, also acids, acetic and butyl acid, as well as different types of solvents, which is acetone, butanol, and also ethanol. So the next one, if I'm going to share on the strategies for the treatment in order for us to obtain high sugars from the biomass so that it is available for the productions of the butanol or other types of biofuel. <clears throat> so there are many types or many categories of the treatment that we can use in order for us to modify the structures of the lignocellulosic biomass or reduce the lignin of the lignocellulosic biomass. So we can do uh, the physical by conducting milling, grinding, chipping or shredding. Uh, the main purpose is uh, to reduce the size of this lignocellulosic biomass so that it will have smaller size, then we have more exposure to the enzyme's activity, more surface area for the enzyme access. Or we can also use the chemical uh, pretreatment process, either using the acid, the alkali, the ionic liquids. So usually directly, if you're using chemical, it's quite easy, but somehow it is not environmental friendly. And we need some treatment in order to remove the chemical after the process. Another pretreatment process is the physical chemical can be done using either steam explosion or liquid hot water or superheated steam. So this one will uh, usually reduce the amounts of lignin as well as alter the structures of the nucleosic materials so that it is instead of tough, it will become soft and uh, easy to be further treated or easy to be uh, utilized by the enzymes to produce the sugar. <clears throat> And last but not least, we can also use the pretreatment using the biological process, either using the microorganism in order to degrade uh, the lign lignin, mostly lignin components of these uh, linoselosic components, uh, linoselosic materials, uh, so that uh, leftover is uh, some carbohydrate materials, and it also uh, alter the structures of uh, by having these microorganisms growing in the biomass we can also alter the structures of this uh, particular biomass so that after that uh, more sugar can be obtained from the hydrolysis process. Or as we are using the ligninase enzymes uh, through the enzymatic process, uh, selectively degrade the lignin and does not digest the carbohydrate, but somehow uh, the ligninase is quite uh, expensive. <clears throat> So in this particular research, we have tested several kinds of strategies or treatment strategies in order to produce more sugars uh, from the oil palm biomass. The first one, we are using the superheated steam pretreatment. Without any treatment, we only apply the superheated steam pretreatment. All right, to two types of these uh, biomass material, which is oil palm and triple bunch, and also oil palm and soccer fiber. So by doing this uh, particular separated steam treatment, we can see that some of the uh, silica body has been removed from the fiber for both type of uh, the biomass. After we conduct the separated steam treatment, then we are do the saccharification process for both untreated and also superheated steam treatment only. And we can see that it is about only 80% of sugar uh, being reduced as compared to the untreated one. <clears throat> so the next one, if using the enzymatic pretreatment using the lacase, is a type of lignase enzyme that capable to digest the lignin so that internal structures of the cellulose and hemicellulose will be exposed for the sugar production. So in this particular experiment, we are, uh, what we call, we uh, study the effects of different loadings of the lacase enzyme. Uh, 
uh, for two types of uh, uh, material, which is similar oil palm and foot bunch as well as oil palm mesocarp fiber. And from this experiment, we can see that it is significantly reduced the amounts of lignin uh, for both type of uh, biomass. <clears throat> And after that, we conduct the saccharification process to be compared with the untreated wine. So we can see that if we are doing the uh, uh, enzymatic treatment using the lacase only, we can increase the sugar production by 47 uh, to 54 percent uh, of the sugar produced as compared to the untreated one for both type of uh, material, which is FT for binds as well as mesocarp fiber. <clears throat> The next uh, experiment is on the reduction of size. We are using the milling in order to reduce the size to the size of 2, 1, 0 0.5, and 0 0.25 mm. And after that, all of these uh, different size of material are used for the saccharification process. And we check uh, the effects of this size reduction for or size reduction only for the sugar production. And we can see that size reduction have a little bit significant uh, improvement in terms of the sugar production, whereby it increased 14% for the oil palm mesocarp fiber and 33% for the oil palm MT4 bunch. <clears throat> the next one is we try to combine those uh, pre-treatment strategies, which is superheated steam, uh, followed by the uh, size reduction, followed by the lacase pre-treatment, and after that we check the glucose production. So by conducting this one, we can see that the cellulose composition uh, after the superheated steam, after the size reduction, after the lacase are uh, increasing, and the lignin removal is also increasing. <clears throat> So, and then we are using this particular material and we check the amounts of sugar being, reduced, being produced. So as compared to the untreated one, so the superheated steam plus lacase with the size reduction to 0 0.25 millimeter can produce, they can increase the sugar by up to 78% for the oil palm and fruit bunch and 79% for the oil palm mesoca fiber. So combinations of this particular experiment of ferment uh, particular pre-treatment strategies are capable to increase the sugar production. Another improvement strategies that we can do in order to increase uh, the biobutanol production from biomass is the by selecting a suitable microorganisms for the process. So as I mentioned to you just now, mostly we are using the Clostridium species in order to produce the biobutanol. <clears throat> However, there are several research that have been done to mutate uh, this clostridium species and it's capable to produce higher biobutanol as compared to the wild type. However, for the genetically engineered strain, somehow uh, we cannot see any improvement in terms of the biobutanol production. <clears throat> Another strategy that we can do is by conducting the medium formulation. So we have the sugars that we can obtain from the starch biomass. We have the sugars that we can obtain from the linoslucid material as well as sugars from the algae biomass. And then these sugars need to be mixed with some supplements in order to enhance or to induce the cell to produce more butanol. So usually the formulations of uh, for butanol production, we can do or we can use P2 medium or TYA medium. Uh, this is quite uh, uh, optimal medium formulation for the butanol production. However, for the sugar, it should be more than 40 gram per liter and not more than 100 gram per liter. If more than 40 gram per liter, it will tend to produce more acids only and low solvents has been produced. And if you are using more than 100 gram per liter, uh, the cells will experience uh, substrate inhibition. For the nitrogen concentration, usually we are using yeast extract because it's contained of histidine and the amount is about 6 gram per liter. The pH for the fermentation process is about 5.5. If too high, it will produce more acids. If too low, it cannot grow. Or we can add on additional compounds, for example, butyric acid, flavonoid, methylvinyl, iron, and other types of uh, supplements that have been uh, researched by other, types, by other researchers as well. The next improvement strategies that have been done by me and my team is on the integrated bioprocessing. 
So if we can see that the steps to produce the biobutanol is quite numerous, so we have the biomass, undergo the treatment, then we need to have the cellulose production and the enzymatic hydrolysis after the ABE fermentation and then AC2 recovery, then we can obtain the biobutanol. So this particular process, we call it separate hydrolysis uh, ferment and fermentation. And we can also combine the uh, recovery with the fermentation process the fermentation process with the recovery, uh, we call it in-situ recovery or separate hydrolysis and fermentation uh, with the recovery process, or we combine the fermentation process with the enzymatic hydrolysis process, we call it simultaneous saccharification and fermentation. And definitely this simultaneous process, we can do combined together with the recovery process of the in-situ recovery process in order to obtain the butanol. Or in the future, we can also do the consolidated bioprocessing strategies by combining uh, all the process together by having the cellulose production, enzymatic hydrolysis, ABE fermentation, in situ recovery into one flask at the same time. Or in the future, so we are looking forward to have the treatment process together into a flask so that we can shorten the process, reduce the energies and apparatus, so then the operational cost can be reduced. So for this particular integrated bioprocessing, we have done uh, for the simultaneous saccharification and fermentation with delay yeast extract feeding and in situ recovery. <clears throat> for this particular experiment, we are using the oil pump and tofu bunch as our model substrates. So this substrates is undergo pre-treatment process as usual, produce the sugars and then conduct the fermentation process and they do the in situ recovery in order to obtain the butanol. And the process is being done is simultaneous sacrification and fermentation by combining the sacrification and also the fermentation process at the same time in the same flask. So this is how we conduct that uh, particular experiment. So the solid substrate is being loaded into the bioreactor and this simultaneous sacrification process uh, are using the optimal condition that have been published before this by us. And then we also integrate this uh, bioprocessing with the in-situ recovery using the gas stripping in order to obtain a pure biobutanol at the end of the process. However, since this is our first time using this uh, oil pump and food bunch for this simultaneous process in the bioreactor, we need to check on the mixing process first. So it is either suitable to use Russian turbine or pitch turbine, or we need to remove the buffer and so on. So from this particular experiment, we can see that we need to use the pitch turbine in order to have a very well proper mixing without the uh, presence of the baffle inside the bioreactor. <clears throat> So for the process part, we have the separate hydrolysis and fermentation. We have simultaneous saccharification and fermentation, and also the simultaneous process with the delay yeast extract feeding. So for the delay yeast extract feeding, instead of we introduce the yeast extract at the beginning of the fermentation process, we hold that one until 39 hours, then we introduce it so that the style will be stressed and it will produce more butanol as compared to the normal process. So from this operation, we can see that as compared to the separate hydrolysis, which is the traditional process that being conducted uh, previously uh, to the simultaneous process, it is almost <coughs> uh, similar uh, in terms of the biobutanol production concentration. Uh, if we are conducting the simultaneous process with delay extract feeding, it can increase the butanol production by about 46%. And if we introduce the in-situ recovery system into this particular process, it can further increase by another 11%. So in total, it can increase by about 72% as compared to the normal SSF. Uh, with this uh, SSF, with delay extract feeding and also in-situ recovery. So another improvement is in terms of the fermentation mode. Usually we are using the batch fermentation mode for the uh, biobutanol production. It is simple and easy process. However, we have these particular challenges. So in order to overcome these particular challenges, we can introduce the fat batch. It is designed to overcome low initial substrate uh, content, substrate concentration. However, by having fat batch system, we will face another problem, which is accumulations of solvents and acids, which subsequently cause product inhibition. 
cease the cell to produce more solvents or more butanol. So therefore we must equip, if we want to conduct the fat batch fermentation process, we must equip the system with the in-situ recovery so that the product will be removed out from the system. <coughs> Another fermentation mode that we can use is the continuous system. It can reduce realization steps and inoculation time. However, usually this system is not very common or very, very attractive for the butanol production because uh, it's difficult to achieve steady state. And also we have the problem in terms of switch from the acidogenesis to solventogenesis. So in order for us to use this particular fermentation mode, so we can try to use uh, immobilized culture uh, so that uh, the culture is, will be available inside this uh, system throughout the process. So th for this particular experiment, we have tested, uh, we have published for this simultaneous sacrification and fermentation of sago hampas into biobutanol by Clostridium acetobutylicum ATCC824. And we are using the sago hampas as the model substrates, all almost similar, except for this one, instead of using the simultaneous sacrification and fermentation process only, we try to conduct the sequential simultaneous sacrification and fermentation, as well as delayed simultaneous sacrification and fermentation. So we have tested, uh, in order to do that, we have uh, tried to find the optimal condition for the amounts of amylase being used, as well as the cellulose being used, and also the substrate concentration. We're also testing for the suitable temperature for the hydrolysis in order to produce uh, enough sugar. 60 degrees Celsius is usually optimal condition for the hydrolysis process. 37 degrees Celsius is optimal condition for fermentation process and we are testing uh, 37 degrees Celsius for hydrolysis and it produces almost similar sugar as compared to the 60 degrees Celsius. So this is the process that have been done. We have the SSF. For the sequential SSF, the amylase we add at the beginning. However, the cellulase we add after 48 hours. This function to reduce the viscosity. Another one is delay SSF, whereby we conduct the sacrification process inside the bottle flask. After, 28, uh, after 24 hours, then we add the enoculum into the uh, system. This is in order to provide enough initial sugar for the fermentation process. And from this experiment, we can see that in terms of the butanol production, as compared to the normal simultaneous sacrification and fermentation only, uh, to the delay simultaneous sacrification and fermentation, it has increased by 21% of the butanol production. And our recent research is related to the enzymatic sacrification with sequential substrate feeding and sequential enzyme loading to enhance fermentable sugar production from sago hampas. So definitely we designed this particular experiments in order to enhance the amounts of sugars and subsequently after that, we can do these uh, uh, strategies as part of this like almost fat batch uh, fermentation, but however, we call it as sequential substrate feeding because we sequentially adding the substrates into the, the system uh, as well as sequentially adding the enzymes into the system as well. So this is basically the flow charts of this particular experiment. So we have all of this uh, experiment uh, for the effects of feeding interval, effect of enzyme loading, as well as effects of agitation speeds uh, towards the fermentable sugars production. After we optimize the fermentable sugars production, then we will be testing this one for the butanol production using this particular system. So what this particular system have done, we are capable by doing the sequential substrate feeding and sequential enzyme loading, we are capable to increase the sugars by 20% as compared to the control one. And the most interesting one is we're capable to reduce the amounts usage by, by conducting the sequential enzymes loading into the system reduce the cellulose amount by 50% and reduce the amylase amount by 80%. I think that's all uh, uh, All the information that related with uh, our research that utilizing usually mostly uh, biomass from the agricultural industries, uh, specifically the oil palm biomass as well as the sago biomass. Uh, for the productions of biofuels, and in my research area, is mostly on the biobutanol part.
So before I end, I would like to acknowledge my research team, which is my supervisors when I was a student, as well as my mentor at the moment, which is Professor Dr. Suraini Abdul Aziz, uh, together with Professor Datuk Dr. Muhammad Ali Hassan, Associate Prof. Dr. Pang Lai, uh, my students, uh, Nur Fatin Atirah, Muhammad Siddiq, uh, Hazwani already graduated and currently uh, conducting this research, particularly recent research is Nurul Hazikah Alias. And I would like to acknowledge the financial support for this biobotanical research solely for this biobotanical research, which is a fundamental research grant scheme by Ministry of Education, uh, Grant Putra by the University of Putra Malaysia, as well as Science and Technology Research Partnership for Sustainable Development Satraps by the Ministries of Education and also uh, Japan International Cooperation Agencies and sole collaborator for the biobotanical production, uh, which is Korean University. Uh, Professor Dr. Su Kim. I believe that's all uh, the information that I have shared for this um, biomass to biofuels. Thank you very much. Okay, many thanks, uh, Dr. Muhammad Faisal Ibrahim, for the nice lecture. And while we are waiting for the QA sessions, uh, I'd like to move on to the second lecture that will be delivered by uh, Dr. Ari Bakhtiar Krishna Putra uh, from IPF. And before we begin with the second lecture, I'd like to also introduce the second speaker, uh, Dr. Ari Bakhtiar from ITS. Uh, wait. Uh, okay. So probably you can also see in the screen. Dr. Ari Bahtiar Krishna Putra, PhD, uh, and his bachelor in mechanical engineering, I guess, from ITS Surabaya, and then also the uh, master of engineering from the same university from ITS. And then he obtained a PhD degree in mechanical and aerospace engineering from uh, Gyeongsang National University. Uh, to name a few of his academic and professional experiences, uh, Dr. Ari Bahtiar uh, has been the head of Associations of Indonesian Business Incubator, IB, for East Java. And then he was the head of ITS Industrial Incubator. And currently, uh, he is a team for designing and manufacturing of mobile gasifier power plant for biomass power. So, and his research interests and latest project include heat transfer and thermodynamics, also energy conversions. And last year, and I assume it's still running to this year, uh, uh, he developed a battery vehicles platform electric to support ITS autonomous car. And then the design of main components of the waste heat recovery based power plant prototype in binary systems. And the last is mini downdraft gasifications power plant based on palm oil to support the waste handling of palm oil industry into an environmentally friendly source of electrical energy in Indonesia. So I, I think this is still related to biomass as what we have listened to the, our uh, first speaker, so uh, Dr. Ari Bahtiar, we are looking forward to your lecture. So, yeah, time is yours. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ruri. Nice, yeah. I think the first uh, speaker is nice presentation. I better become a, a participant. Then I, I ask many questions to uh, Dr. Muhammad Faisal. <laughs> Very interested. So I will, uh, I want to share my PowerPoint. Okay. Okay, I hope uh, I can speak in English uh, fastly and then clearly because I don't prepare in English. Maybe I speak in dual, uh, bilingual in English and Suroboyoan, okay. This uh, my uh, presentation is about opportunities, challenges, and barriers for implementation ways to energy in Indonesia. Uh, waste to energy uh, or waste yeah, is a problem in Indonesia. So 
many kind of uh, technology and uh, stakeholder already conduct uh, many research and many work to uh, finish or to reduce waste in Indonesia. I am from uh, Sustainable Energy Research Center in ATS and from Mechanical Engineering Department uh, as a lecturer. Okay, uh, this already mentioned Mr. Dr. Wuri, yeah. I want to continue. Uh, okay, we, we, we want to discuss about the waste, municipal waste. This is the main problem in Asia. This is a picture of urban settlements and their waste problems. In the right picture is in Bandung, maybe uh, 20 years ago, yeah, and is in Jakarta. Yeah, uh, right now is I think is clean already. All government, uh, city government already make some model, make some treatment. Then uh, uh, waste is already zero, zero waste. But uh, something is a problem in landfill, in uh, waste landfill. Yeah. Okay, we continue. Before we want to exploit uh, waste to the energy, we have to recognizing the problems. Yeah. This is a waste quantity and composting uh, composition analysis uh, in TPA Benowo. TPA is tempat pembuangan akhir, yeah, or a final landfill waste yeah, in Surabaya. This is uh, from years 28, uh, 2018 until 27. Uh, this is uh, conducting about uh, life cycle assessment, LCA, yeah, for waste treatment uh, thermally yeah, from uh, our lecture in uh, Department of Environment, uh, Department of Environmental, uh, Ms. Ms. Uh, ID, IDAI, Warma Dewanti. So I want to show you that uh, our waste in municipal waste in Surabaya uh, for year to years increases. Yeah. And then uh, totally yearly is be, uh, more, more than 900 in 27, yeah, in 27, 900,000 tons. Yeah. It's very, very big uh, amount of waste. And uh, day by day, uh, we collecting the sample of uh, waste yeah, in TPA Benowo. And then we want to measure, we want to analyze uh, the composition. Yeah? And <clears throat> this is a mean, yeah, or we, we call a major composition of uh, waste is uh, sampah dapur. Yeah? We call uh, oh boy, uh, kitchen waste. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, 39 percent. This uh, have a low calor calorific value. Then maybe we can change to energy. We are only can change to uh, maybe organic composting. Yeah. And this uh, sampah kebun. Yeah. 20 percent. And plastic. Plastic is um, uh, I think is still big. Yeah. 30 13 percent. This is also the main problem in Indonesia, uh, plastic waste, yeah, plastic waste. And then the others is uh, textile, cartoon, karet, yeah. Sorry, in this Indonesian language, yeah. Uh, sampah tercampur is about, uh, and the energy is about uh, 5,311 kilojoule per kilogram. But uh, organic uh, without bio waste is uh, 9,000, yeah. So it's uh, from uh, Buwarma, yeah, Buwarma Research. Uh, this is a paradig old paradigm of which uh, treatment in many can many city in Indonesia. This is waste collection is very poor uh, treatment, and then in uh, TPA, uh, tempat pembuangan uh, akhir, or we call final uh, landfill, yeah, uh, final waste landfill is very uh, have a big problem with uh, uh, community and also pollution and uh, many kind of uh, health uh, dangers. Yeah? I think it's very, very 
very uh, have a big problem in par in old department of uh, waste treatment yeah and then we have a solution uh, waste we can convert to energy waste to energy and uh, waste to can convert to green farming now it's a, i think is opportunity to us to change waste to green farming but in this presentation i will focus only on waste to energy this uh, new paradigm new paradigm of uh, our uh, waste treatment yeah in, in indonesia so before collecting all in the final landfill yeah uh, this is a temporary landfill so uh, some of waste become a uh, compost yeah uh, organic compost and then sometime uh, become uh, energy i work in the tps yeah tempat buangan sampah sementara or we call temporary landfill uh, waste we can create uh, energy uh, maybe not much uh, maybe uh, only five five kilowatts until 10 kilowatts but is the problem uh, reducing waste is uh, almost finished yeah. artinya uh, the mean is uh, reducing waste is uh, for biology treatment and also for uh, uh, with uh, biology treatment and also with uh, thermal treatment okay and then we continue uh, <clears throat> this is strategic of uh, waste management hierarchies as part of the national waste management so is disposal landfill is least desirable and then most desirable is uh, waste is reduced yeah and reuse and recycle yeah or we call composting yeah and recover recover is uh, energy from waste but uh, we know that recover or energy to waste uh, energy from waste is uh, uh, the efficiency is very low but i think is uh, we have to do this because it can it can reduce uh, waste very uh, big yeah very big um, value and this is waste to energy uh, for thermal technology from waste we can uh, before we thermos chemical processing we have to get a pre treatment transport and storage nah, this is a big uh, uh, i think is very costly yeah the process pre treatment transport and storage in indonesia especially is very very costly because uh, our waste uh, from uh, fair, uh, uh, municipal waste is not not spirit yeah but uh, mix yeah. so we have to treatment we have to spare it uh, <clears throat> with uh, organic which uh, unorganic and which uh, have a high energy which uh, have a, a low energy we have to uh, have a pre-treatment process is i think is very very high cost yeah and transport also and storage yeah. storage very a big land we have to uh, available yeah we have to have a big land maybe 30000 uh, 37 hectare yeah so very very big then uh, after that we have to uh, change the waste to energy by thermochemical processing uh, many kind of thermo uh, thermochemical processing first is uh, combustion direct combustion yeah and then we get thermal energy uh, thermal energy we can use uh, as a, a heat uh, for heat to uh, maybe some air uh, uh, sorry apa? air uh, water and maybe some process in industry like uh, tofu industry they need many uh heat to uh process their product yeah and then uh conversion to secondary energy carrier yeah uh two kind gasification and pyrolysis yeah gasification product uh, is a sign gas yeah? synthetic gas and then uh we have a gaseous fuel yeah and pyrolysis we have a, a liquid fuel this is a uh, two kind of uh, conversion uh, to secondary energy carriers. Uh, simple things is uh, I think, in my opinion, is the gasification. Uh, 
because we can get gaseous fuel and then we can uh, to generate power from uh, gas engine we call a uh, gas engine is a kind of a gen set generating set yeah. this is a different between combustion gasification and pyrolysis uh, with temperature combustion is 800 until 1450 and gasification 400 until uh, 1800 yeah. and pyrolysis uh, lower is 20 uh, 250 until 900 yeah and then uh, stoichiometric ratio combustion is uh, you have to more than one yeah you have a stoichiometric ratio but gasification uh, should uh, lower than one and pyrolysis is zero because pyrolysis is uh, no need uh, oxygen Uh, to con to process yeah and gas phase uh, <coughs> gas phase is a uh, uh, co2 h2o is to yeah water and o2 nitrogen and gasification is uh, hydrogen uh, carbon monoxide carbon dioxide methane uh, h2o uh, water and nitrogen and pyrolysis uh, Ya, yeah, musim ya yeah, H2CO uh, H2O N2 and hidrokarbon ya. Yeah. And solid phase uh, S ya, yeah, slag is combustion, gasification, but pyrolysis S and cook. Liquid phase, oke, okay, from pyrolysis oil and water. Uh, this many kind of uh, many type of combustion uh, for waste to energy we can use grid combustion rotary kilns and free dice pads yeah where is the best uh, model uh, is uh, depend on the kind of waste yeah but because we call uh, we, we we want to uh, treatment we want to treat uh, municipal municipal waste so better we use grid Yeah, because if we use free dice bed, it's very high technology and also uh, high cost. Yeah, and for gasification is uh, more simple. Yeah, it's fixed bed, free dice bed, and cyclone. Yeah, and for for pyrolysis is fixed beds, free dice bed, moving bed, and train flow, rotary kiln, and ablative. Yeah, there's many kind of combustion gasification and pyrolysis. Uh, we can choose uh, with the best uh, or suitable for our uh, waste, uh, municipal waste. This is uh, for their combustion. Yeah. Uh, this is tipping floors. Yeah. This is truck. And then with uh, collecting hills. This is refuse pit and uh, some uh, cranes, uh, some uh, transport, yeah. reduce charge. And then this is a uh, go to grids. This is grids, grids uh, stuker. Yeah, we call grids stuker. Uh, this waste is uh, burn here, and then create uh, heat uh, in furnace. And then heat from uh, waste, uh, they uh, evaporate uh, steam, yeah, water, and then become steam. The steam, then. Uh, Again, the apa uh, the panasi ya yeah, heated and then create a higher temperature ya yeah. higher temperature we call superheat yeah, superheat steam and uh, superheated steam go to uh, turbine ya yeah. and then steam turbine create a generator create a electrical by uh, generator ya yeah. this is a Uh, after yeah, after treatment after process treatment so this uh, process of uh, waste to energy is uh, not harm to environment yeah uh, this is acid gas yeah uh, scrubber and then uh, this is many kind of uh, filter uh, backhouse filter and then to the stack yeah with ID fan. Okay. Then uh, 
another model is uh, we call classification yeah uh, almost same yeah and but a different type yeah it is uh, the products of uh, hydrogen carbon dioxide carbon monoxide and hydrogen oxygen uh, we call water and then uh, get quenched to cold rapidly and then we get synthetic gas cleaning yeah uh, this go through synthetic gas cleaning and some uh, can get uh, produce uh, synthetic gas hydrogen methanol ammonia and uh, many kind of energy utilization yeah and uh, sulfur yeah the 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 uh, emission is sulfur and uh, for uh, process of water treatment this is a uh, pure water salt uh, zinc concentrate yeah and uh, from slag yeah we get uh, metals and mineral yeah uh, this is kind of a uh, classification process uh, this is a pyrolysis process yeah Paralysis process uh, the waste to feed stock bin and then um, get a high temperature to process. Then we get a gasified product vapor and then vapor to condens condensation to condensate and then we get a liquid. Yeah, we get a condensed liquid and then become a fuel. Yeah. But for uh municipal municipal waste is i think it's very difficult if we have if we use a paralysis process yeah uh i think this is a combustion i think we, we not here maybe too detail if one if you want to ask maybe i will show you this is quite uh, many kind of paralysis yeah and advantage or the advantage, yeah. Uh, I think we we can discuss later. Okay, this is a uh, uh, advantage is uh, for combustion. We have a high energy, yeah? high uh, heat energy, but we have emission, yeah, very bad, yeah. This is the uh, environmental pollution. So for environmental pollution uh, can results. Yeah? Flue gas cleaning contributes uh, 15 until 30 percent of TCI. Stage of comply with legislation. Legislation. Yeah? So uh, emission is uh, Indonesia is very uh, strong. Yeah, very strong regulation for emission because uh, we call lingkungan hidup. Yeah. Uh, environment uh, 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 department of environmental uh, already make some regulation that uh, we have to careful about the emission so a combustion emission is not uh, environmental friendly uh, the second is gasification is a cleaner fuel yeah uh, cleaner fuel uh, and flexible fuel uh, flexible fuel yeah uh, but preparation of this often required. Yeah? So pre-treatment, uh, we have to prepare and it make a high cost. Yeah? And uh, pyrolysis, yeah? pyrolysis is uh, many kind of product we can get, uh, liquid, gas, and char. Yeah? Uh, so preparation of this often required is uh, the advantage. Yeah? We have uh, like drying treatment, and size reduction, so the cost is higher than uh, gasification. Yeah, this is a uh, Surabaya landfill gas plant, landfill gas power plant, uh, two megawatts yeah, in gas collecting system. This is a uh, uh, Surabaya waste, yeah, already collecting here in landfill, and then. Covered, uh, covered with uh, uh, we call geomembrane. So the gas, yeah, like uh, methane, uh, can uh, easily out, but uh, out with uh, okay, 
we call uh, some pipe yeah we we use some pipe and then connecting to gas engine yeah uh, gas engine here uh, this is a fuel skid and engine uh, gas from landfill gas here to generate electric power with gas engine yeah and uh, the second type of uh, thermal process yeah, for waste in Surabaya is gasification power plant, a higher, uh, and a higher output of electrical is a nine megawatt. Yeah. So this is a sequence of process gasification for this kind of power plant. First is preconditioning, like uh, sorting, crushing, and drying. And then waste storage in pit, yeah. And material feeding system, primary gasification chamber, and secondary combustion chamber, uh, water treatment plant, and boilers. This is a sequence uh, process of gasification, yeah. And this is a schematic gasification to energy, yeah, in Surabaya. Uh, here is uh, from storage pitch. This is grab type elevator. And then we come here. Then uh, this is rotary, uh, rotary garage wire. It's uh, rotated, yeah. Rotating, uh, but uh, not high RPM, only small RPM. And then uh, the waste is burned here. Uh, gasification process conduct here and then create a gas, uh, syn gas, and uh, syn gas through the secondary combustion chamber, uh, heated again, and then have a high temperature to evaporate uh, water to steam until superheat. And then uh, through the main steam, main steam pipe, to steam turbine and to generate electrical yeah, nine megawatts. And for the combustion uh, emission, yeah, uh, we have many kind of uh, treatment like the, acid, as the acidification uh, tower and then also active carbon feeding device. Also, we have a, a back dust collector, back type, Dust collecting, dust collector, yeah, and then this is a stack, yeah, the chimney. This all controllable by uh, uh, CCR, yeah, or we call DCS, distributed control system. And then uh, this operator will easily monitor and then uh, change the variables of uh, process, yeah, because you know. Uh, Waste is many, many, uh, many kind and also many type of waste and many, uh, maybe a uh, high heating value also many uh, moisture content. Yeah, so it's different type of of waste. Then we have to uh, control by smart control. Yeah, smart control. Uh, model yeah this is a uh, systematically uh, schematically classification to energy in Benawa. this is a Benawa power plant yeah uh, this is uh, this building and this is a dts yeah this is distributed control system and turbine turbine room so this operator will control and monitor uh, the process yeah this is a turbine room uh, this is a waste storage pit uh, before and after. This is, this is uh, still not uh, waste here. So uh, I will I, I get this photo, photograph because still new. So if you want to come, that now maybe is full of waste. Yeah, very very uh, full of waste. So you can get this kind of picture because it's uh, empty. When I get this picture, is empty space, yeah, empty storage space, yeah. And this is boilers uh, before and after. These boilers, yeah, 
uh, almost same with uh, uh, common boilers ya yeah. but uh, I think very high cost because uh, the material is uh, should be uh, corrosive resistance ya yeah. because you know our municipal waste is many many kind many type many composition so for a better better or for longer time of a boiler uh, life cycle so we have should uh, we should have a good material to operate this boiler yeah and this is a gasifier yeah it is a rotary rotating gasifier and then uh, we come to up uh, come to top and then uh, make uh, some gas from gasifying process yeah uh, this is a uh, rot to rotate okay and then this is our project in a small scale small scale uh, waste to energy sorry ini Indonesia peroleh dari energi sampah ini dipakai sebagai penerangan jalan sekitar TPA Wonorejo dan penerangan kebun bibit Wonorejo Surabaya. This is we collecting our waste and then it's all still manual ya. Yeah? <laughs> Because uh... jadi sampah jadi berkah. Itulah gambaran dari kondisi yang terjadi di tempat pembuangan sampah Wonorejo Rumput so, Surabaya. Wonorejo Rumput. Ya? Berawal dari rasa keprihatinan banyaknya sampah yang tidak bermanfaat, ide pembuatan listrik dari sampah pun tercetus. Di awal, di awalnya kita akan melihat sampah itu kan bermasalah ya, jadi di masyarakat itu, sama yang tidak termanfaatkan. Kalau termanfaat bisa jadikan kompos, Pak. Bisa jadikan kompos, tapi yang tidak bisa dimanfaatkan lagi, baru kita lakukan semacam pembakaran. Jadi bukan pembakaran, tapi dia terdasifikasi. Cara pengolahannya terbilang mudah. Sampah terlebih dahulu di kemudian dimasukkan uh, ke dalam tabung gas untuk diolah menjadi CO2 uh, gas metan. Dan CO2 disalurkan ke genset. Setelah ya, genset menyala, listrik kemudian disimpan ke dalam aki. This, uh, listrik yang diperoleh dari contact. energi sampah ini dipakai to... sebagai penerang jalan di sekitar TPA yeah, Wonorejo to... dan penerang kebun bibit Wonorejo, uh, Surabaya, Jawa Timur. The... Dari Surabaya, this... Jawa Timur, Nur Syafi'i memberitakan. Okay. This is, uh, sama Pengolahan kita, ya. sampah yang baik selain mengurangi permasalahan sebanyak 4 kil sampah di rumah kompos dapat mengurangi In jambangan ya, uh, pusat terulang dengan baik akan menyebabkan uh, permasalahan in jambangan. Pemerintah Kota Surabaya menjadi percontohan untuk kota dan kabupaten di Indonesia dalam pengolahan sampah. Selain diolah menjadi pupuk kompos dan daur ulang, sampah di Kota Surabaya diubah menjadi listrik. <laughs> Ya, ranting dan juga plastik inilah yang menjadi bahan utama untuk membuat listrik di rumah kompos Surabaya. Dan di sini ini merupakan salah satu aktivitas untuk mengubah dari ranting dan juga plastik menjadi listrik. Nah, sekarang saya sudah bersama dengan Pak Asari yang merupakan pengawas dari rumah kompos Jambangan. Ya, Bapak, bisa dijelaskan secara singkat bagaimana sebenarnya proses dari untuk pembuatan listrik ini? Ya. Oke, okay. eh, saya lanjutkan aja. Nah, uh, this is our result ya yeah. research in cooperation with industry uh, with PT PJB pembangkit Jawa Bali uh, we create a modular waste biomass classifier ya yeah. because uh, by modular waste biomass classifier are highly flexible uh, where gas fire equipment such as uh, oven furnace boiler and engine Uh, like internal combustion engine can be connected directly with gasifier. Yeah? So, <clears throat> so we can modular, we can uh, easily mobile this with biomass from uh, one uh, we call village to another village. Yeah. Then, uh, syngas can replace uh, fossil fuel. 
but we still use uh, dual dual fuel uh, from diesel fuel and then uh, with syn gas yeah and gasification is the the best method with the least uh, at least with the least emission yeah jadi uh, emission is very friendly uh, for uh, environment yeah Uh, gasification is able to produce energy that is cheaper and more efficient than the steam process used in combustion or we call incineration yeah. and this is a product development opportunity in our lab in uh, pusat studi energi berkelanjutan uh, sustainable energy research center in ETS like uh, we call bio-based transportation fuel yeah bio power bio based product ya yeah. eh uh, is depend on feedstock ya yeah. feedstock sorry feedstock uh, production processing and conversion product use and distribution and public policy measure ya yeah. uh, i think is uh, many kind that we can conduct in uh, bio ya yeah. like uh, mr dr Muhammad Hamid. This is the, it has students uh, produce uh, the after the catalyst for rice as S. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, this is one of uh, research for our student. And then uh, this is our startup. Yeah. Uh, is uh, biogas for uh, village. Yeah. We call uh, daerah tertinggal village. Uh, Disadvantaged village. Okay. We call this disadvantage village so uh, we can create uh, biogas from uh, cow yeah cow apa ya Tern, uh, limbah sapi yeah kotoran sapi yes. and then create a biogas and this is a filtering uh, machine of a uh, filter machine of uh, biogas and uh, here our startup have uh, some Uh, we call uh, kejuaraan ya yeah. in uh, startup competition ya yeah. uh, he have a champion in startup competition and this is a uh, electricity from tofu i think we still good research nah, and many kind of research uh, connect in connecting in uh, waste ya yeah. Uh, so is our conclusion of the thermal process. First, incineration is able to reduce the mass and volume of landfill, thus reducing the burden of deep uh, landfill management in cities. Yeah? Significant advances in emissions control have succeeded in reducing dioxin and furan. Yeah? So uh, we have uh, a kind of advance in emission control in reducing dioxin and furan ya yeah, to uh, get uh, friendly uh, for our environment ya yeah. and then the heat generated after combustion can be used to generate steam it can be used to drive the turbine to generate the electricity but given the condition of garbage, of uh, waste uh, municipal waste or we call garbage in Indonesia that is still mixed still mix and wet will result in less visible converting waste into electricity so it's not visible converting waste into electricity in our case in Indonesia waste or get waste garbage in Indonesia and gasification and pyrolysis are highly efficient ways to producing waste energy but more efficient than combustion or incineration And gasification is highly flexible, where gas-fired equipment such as oven, furnace, boiler, and engine internal combustion, internal combustion engine can be connected directly with gasifier or syn gas can directly replace fossil fuels. Yeah. Gasification is able to produce energy that is cheaper and more efficient that, than the steam process used in combustion in our incineration. I think is uh, my presentation. Thank you. If you have any question, I will uh, answer it. But if I can, maybe I will discuss 
with my team and also Dr. Uri. Thank you, Dr. Uri, for your time. Okay, many, many thanks, uh, Dr. Ali Bahtiar Kristapu. And it is now a questions and answer sessions Q&A. So if you have questions, please raise your hand. But at the moment, we already have two questions from the, the participants. So the first question is, uh, is directed to uh, Dr. Faisal. It's come, uh, the question is from uh, Mr. I suppose Mr. Adiola from ITS Surabaya. So here I quote the questions uh, directly. So we have known that biomass is a very potential to become renewable energy resources. For example, produce methane gas by anaerobic digestion process. Then it could be converted into biofuel and etc. So I think this technology is not expensive and it is known technology or mature technology. So I think many people could operate this technology easily but why most people think are still using fossil fuels as energy source? So I think that's uh, that's a motivation question. Why uh, biofuels is engaged to replace uh, fossil fuels? So I give the time to Dr. Faisal Ibrahim to answer this question. All right. Uh, thank you very much for the question. So basically, this is a uh, bit no right and no wrong uh, to answer this particular question because I was not fully uh, know what is the, the main reasons this has happened. But I hope I give my opinion based on what I have obtained uh, based on our previous research as well. We have conducted this APEX project last time, actually on the zero emission concept for the palm oil industry. So we try to utilize all the biomass, uh, all the ways to be converted into value added products, including uh, biocompost and also biofuels. But somehow when we want to propose this one to the industry so that they can implement that uh, to, the, to their palm oil meal, uh, somehow not all industries are very interested in doing this one. The first reason is they need to invest some capital in order to modify the meal uh, to come out or to utilize this particular uh, technology. And another one thing, that, uh, another one reason is they are already familiar with their current business. They're making profit from their current business. Uh, they don't have any enforcement from the government, don't have any enforcement from the other authorities. There is no force for them to change from the normal situations to the, uh, I mean, uh, more better situations then they will stick to that particular situation. That's what we obtained from our uh, town hall with the industries after we conduct the zero emission concept for the pump oil industries. But I believe that uh, soon or later, since we are aware on the environmental pollutions, climate changes and so on, sustainable, sustainable development goals, we are going towards a better way in order to produce the products for our consumption. That is my answer. I hope I answered the question. Okay. Uh, many thanks. Uh, I guess if the 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 participant who asked the questions has a following questions, you can also raise your hand. Ah, okay, so yeah. it's answered. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the next questions uh, is from uh, I suppose Mr. Kito M. Clerico from the Surikao State College of Technology, the Philippines. Uh, I suppose these questions should be addressed by the two speakers. So I quote the questions directly. Does this inventions, so it's supposed the inventions in uh, biopropanol production, for example, and also the inventions in the waste to energy uh, gasification systems, affects our health as its emission is still a gas that could still really affect in little ways. So it's still affecting our life in a little ways. So I, I, I give the, the first uh, opportunity to answer to Dr. Ari Bahtiar. 
<laughs> okay, thank you. Nice, nice question. Yeah. Then I think it's very, very difficult question <laughs> because uh, this uh, waste to energy is not uh, the main purpose. Yeah, the main purpose is waste reduction. Waste reduction. Yeah, okay. This is our main purpose is uh, waste reduction. So waste to energy is uh, one of uh, model, one of uh, uh, process, yeah, to create energy from waste. But I think if uh, we have a zero waste is better for our life, yeah. Zero zero waste is uh, you can treat like uh, from organic waste become a compost, yeah. So we can. Uh, we have many compost and we have many plant plantation. It's a very it's a better way. But if there is still a waste from uh, first process, and we cannot more uh, conducting process uh, to make uh, some recycle or reuse, and then we uh, the last yeah the last. The last model is a uh, reduction. Reduction type uh, is easily is incineration. Incinerator is uh, uh, our, uh, our 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 process in Indonesia long time ago. Is make uh, some uh, very bad emission, but now I think uh, from Japan technology or uh, from German also. And also some uh, research in Indonesia, our research also can uh, reduce uh, emission from uh, incineration, incinerator. So I think uh, it's, it's my answer, yeah? It, the best way is uh, zero waste, yeah? It's the best way. Recycle, reuse, yeah? But reduction is, um, I think is, uh, if we don't have any kind of uh, technology, okay, we can use, uh, Red, uh, uh, insulation or gasification. I think this is my answer, Mr. Ruri, Dr. Okay, Ruri. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bakti, Ari Bakhtiar. And uh, we would like to uh, uh, listen uh, from, from the side of Dr. Faisal Ibrahim. Uh, all right. So this is uh, uh, my opinion. I think that, yes, any compounds that might, if too much, then it might harm us. All right. So we have the limit of how much compound that should be available in the environment. Uh, in any compounds, if we have even the rice that we eat every day, right, it is okay for us. But if you throw to the environment too much, the rice, that particular rice is also polluted the environment. So we need to know the level that is not harm uh, to the human. Another one is in terms of the significance, uh, which one gives better? Is it reducing, utilizing the biomass to produce the biofuel is better? Or uh, having the butanol, uh, or having the biofuels itself in the environment would harm us more than uh, the benefits of utilizing the biomass uh, to the biofuels. So I think that we are looking forward much more benefits in terms of converting the waste or the biomass to energy instead of that particular compounds harming us. It's not that too much uh, harm to the uh, human. That is my answer. So, yeah, so basically our current technology is directed to less emission, but not uh, not until zero emissions, really, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I hope uh, those two que uh, those two answers already address the questions raised by Mister uh, Chito. Good. Is there any further questions from the participants? You may also raise your hand there and the committee will allow you to uh, speak up there. If not, I have a plenty I? of questions. Ah, oh, yeah, okay. sure. Pak pa Irfan. Uh, <laughs> <Irfan's>. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Sorry, uh, I want to yeah, ask please. a question. Um, I'm, I'm actually, my, my background is, uh, very far from uh, chemical engineering or environmental engineering or mechanical engineering. So my question will be uh, asking your opinion, especially maybe to Dr. Faisal. Uh, 
as you may know, uh, Indonesia, the, the palm oil is, is banned by the European Union. They, they don't want uh, the, well, I think the reason was uh, because with the palm plantation, uh, the, their view is probably that the, um, it, it does more damage than, than actually, uh, you know, the benefit is outweighed by the damage caused by deforestation or the palm oil, uh, palm plantation. What is your opinion? I'm, I'm sorry. We don't have to talk about politics, but, but let's try to do it. Uh, talk about the um, maybe from if there's any study that, that has been performed on how to actually uh, have the, the most benefit so for sustainability from all aspects, not, not only from the emission, but also the the, the ecosystem, wildlife like that. Now, has there been any uh, a study, uh, a holistic study like that? Thank you, I'm <laughs> sorry. All right, I, I try, I try to answer uh, uh, this particular question based on what I know. All right, so basically, uh, yes, we all know the, the, uh, the problem related to the palm oil industries, especially in terms of the plantations of the palm oil, that damaging, especially most on the biodiversity part. So uh, since uh, this has come the issues from the European, especially that they are going to ban us and so on related to this particular part, uh, some what we call some approach have been taken care in order to overcome this problem. I'm not very sure detail because I'm not in the government sites because those who are from the government sites, government officers, they know very well what is exactly the, the problems related for this ban from the European uh, uh, European countries and European people. So, but basically in terms of uh, to, to, to that particular uh, problem related to the biodiversity, I think that like, like Malaysia, we have gazed the amounts of forest that cannot be touched for further plantations of the palm oil. We have uh, meet the uh, saturation points that we cannot further expand the, the area and do the deforestation of uh, 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 any parts in Malaysia to further expand the plantation area. In order to further enhance the or productions of the oil is by increase the yield of the oil extraction. So there is one way in order for us to obtain more oil is to further expand uh, the plantation area. Uh, there is one thing that I know so far, but other than that, maybe uh, uh, we need to further discuss, especially with the government officials who are dealing directly uh, towards the problem uh, banned by the European country. Another one thing, since I'm, I'm part of the um, uh, biomass team in Malaysia, biomass consultant in Malaysia, we're also discussing this part. Uh, one of the problem is that it's not a proper waste management because that one also releasing more greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. That part of the problems that they are looking because if we put like natural degradations of the biomass, it produce uh, some more carbon dioxide, more methane into the atmosphere and increase the uh, greenhouse gases uh, for, uh, in the global. So that is one of the issues that also we rise in our biomass consultant as well. So that is my answer based on what I know so far. <coughs> is there Thank any you. following questions? Pa, yeah, Irfan, yeah. Dr. Irfan? Uh, no, no, it's very clear. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Faisal. Can I, ask, can I ask? Can I ask Mama yeah. Faisal? <laughs> Hello, Dr. Faisal. I hope not a difficult one. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I just uh, very interesting your 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 uh, presentation, yeah, because uh, my family have uh, one uh, not big in in Kalimantan. Uh, we want to uh, plan like cassava. Do you have any research? from cassava to sugar. Okay. Yeah, maybe you can explain the process and then maybe it's feasible or not. If uh, this uh, land, uh, we make some plantation of cassava and then we can generate, generate uh, sugar or energy from cassava. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Faisal. 
<laughs> All right, I try to answer for for that one. Actually, uh, cassava. If you grow the cassava, so the major polysaccharides compound for the cassava is the starch. Uh, it it is very easily, as mentioned inside my presentation, it is very easy in order for us to convert cassava into the sugars and use that one for the uh, fuels production. However, the major issues is that the cassava is used as food. So that's why we are looking for the second generation so if you instead of the first one, using the food as the source for uh, the bioenergy or the energy. So you're looking for the non-food material. Or at least, although we want to use the starch, but the starch must be from the waste processing. It's not the, the one that we use as food. Although we are planting something as that is not food, we also have uh, the competition in terms of the land use for the food production instead of uh, for the energy production instead of the food production. So which one better? We are looking for food as our priority instead of energy, since the energy we can try to obtain from the other source. Uh, okay. I hope I answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Dr. Ibrahim. Okay, uh, I have questions actually, uh, plenty of questions, but uh, I, I would like to uh, spot only two questions to uh, Dr. Faisal Ibrahim, that you claim it is still challenging, right, to build a very efficient uh, uh, biobutanal production, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering at, at which level is cost of energy actually is the current biobutanal uh, at the current or recent state of technology compared to the conventional fuels like diesels? Is it still promising or not to be uh, industrialized? For example, because you, you also mentioned that uh, some industry is not interested to uh, to build this uh, biobutanal uh, processing because it requires high cost of capital, something like that. Uh, have, have you ever calculated the levelized cost of energy of this biobutanal production? Uh, yeah, thank you very much for, for that question. Yeah, definitely we are looking to specifically calculate in terms of the uh, feasibility, in terms of the cost operations and so on. But somehow, uh, basically at the moment, since we know that the price of the fuels, uh, petroleum fuels itself is not that too expensive right now at the moment, so we cannot still uh, biobutanol at very high, so we need to go back uh, to the price, uh, to the market price or global price for the uh, the biobutanol from the petroleum that is on the benchmark. So in order to produce the biobutanol at that particular price is far away uh, at the moment okay. because of mm. those challenging part, uh, those multiple mm. processing mm. and so on. And we also have the problem that the strains that we produce now cannot produce more than two percent of. Uh, butanol. So because of okay. too low, the recovery yeah. process will be very expensive because they need yeah. to remove more amount of water, other types, in order to obtain a very high purities of butanol. However, I'm not very sure because I also check in China, they also produce quite big uh, facilities for the butanol production and they are using continuous system, but I'm not very sure in terms of their uh, profit development yeah. for that particular. Is, is, yeah. is there any incentive from the government, like in terms of it in tariff that is suitable for uh, uh, biobutanol yeah. production or something like that? Yeah. I'm not really sure what is government <laughs> policy at the moment. In yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, there is one way in order for us to capture the cost uh, for the production of biofuel, even for the biodiesel as well. Like we see the, the, the utilization of biodiesel, they have some subsidies from the government in order to enhance the utilization of biodiesel. But for biobutanol, if the government want to do that, then they require a lot of money to be uh, pumped in into that particular uh, incentive because the production cost itself is very expensive. Yeah, I, I don't think at the moment it is capable to, to be put into the industrial or commercial level. Okay, so it, it, is, it is basically not prioritized at the moment in, yeah. in, in Malaysia. Yeah. Okay. Good. And probably one technical question. Uh, I, I, I saw one slide of your presentations that you mentioned there is a, a phytochemicals compound that is used, uh, flavonoids, something yeah, yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, during during the process, and what what it is for? What is it for actually? Uh, all right. I probably lost. I was probably lost during the presentations. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, for this one, when we want to do the fermentation process, we will require some supplements, any supplements in order to make sure that the microorganisms or the cells 
uh, grow happily. Yeah? So we need to mm. put some supplements. So there are several studies that have been done, for example, adding metal violet, iron, the metal elements of flavonoids. The flavonoids, the recent one that I read through, not uh, my study, is by having the ginkgo. They put in some extracts of ginkgo. They put into the fermentation process. Mm. And it's capable to increase the butanol production by certain percentage, uh, which is quite good. So I'm also looking forward to explore this particular research. What kinds of herbs or flavonoids compounds that are capable to enhance the fermentation might not be for the butanol production only. It can be to other types of fermentation okay. process like producing ethanol or hydrogen or any amino acid sensor. Yeah. So, so it's something like a biocatalyzing process during the fermentations. Yeah, yeah, it's like enhancing okay. inducer inducing. Yeah. Mm. Good. I still have one question actually to Dr. Ari Bahtia, but I'm not sure if the time is. Okay, uh, no problem. Did <laughs> <laughs> uh, you have any? It's okay. Yeah, oh, sorry. Still okay. <laughs> Maybe one it's okay, but it's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, just, 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 just out of curiosity, right? Because uh, actually, we we have here in Surabaya already successfully implemented ways to energy or ways to electricity systems, something like that. But why it is not implemented in other cities? What is the main barrier for the diffusion of these ways to energy technology to be adopted in other cities in Indonesia? Is it re is it more related to political? Uh, aspects, sociological acceptance, or maybe the cost is too high? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Surabaya have uh, one, one, uh, uh, pro, uh, have a, I think, sorry, sorry, little bit, uh, some signal. Okay. Uh, I forget about the uh, many, many cities also in, in Indonesia, uh, more than eight, yeah. It's uh, from government, uh, they have to conduct like waste to energy in Surabaya. Uh, but why Surabaya is the first, uh, I think, successful in, we call successful still, still <laughs> in the question mark, yeah? but uh, better than uh, the other uh, uh, city. Because uh, if we want to make some waste to energy, electric, electricity, especially, we have a big land, yeah, big uh, land and far from community. You know, a landfill, landfill collecting of waste. Uh, if a near uh, community is uh, make some problem because they have a smell, okay, and then some pollutant. Uh, some community maybe uh, like uh, people near will protest to government to move uh, to move another land yeah this is the main problem is land because in surabaya we have a, a land very big uh, 37 hectare is uh, far from uh, people from community for for uh, from village and far but uh, in the other city yeah it's uh, very difficult to find which uh, they have uh, some free land. Free land, we, we call it because uh, all community will accept this, uh, their land, we then become a waste to energy uh, process because, you know, a landfill is very bad smell. Yeah, it's one the big problem. And then also economical uh, feasible, feasibility for economic because very, very high, very, very uh, highly cost, yeah. Uh, one megawatt is almost maybe in million rupiah, maybe more than 50, yeah. 50 million rupiah. It's higher, maybe four times better uh, than, uh, higher than if we, call, uh, we have a coal, a coal power plant. Um, uh, conventional coal power plant, higher, four times. Yeah? So the first is uh, social impact and then economic uh, problem. I think it's very, very difficult to uh, some uh, city like uh, DKI Jakarta or like in Solo or Jogja, uh, sorry, Jogja, no? In Sumatra also, many, many city, but they have some difficulties to get uh, a big land to process their uh, 
uh, waste to energy, yeah, uh, social and also economic. But government already make some regulation to process to to speed up of uh, the waste to energy because Indonesia is uh, I think like a Latin problem, yeah. <laughs> Latin problem for uh, munis- municipal waste for garbage because they have many many uh, garbage to have uh, to reduce yeah uh, recycle and reuse already but to reduction to reduce uh, we have uh, they have uh, to have uh, many many technology and also uh, high cost technology. I think many many technology in in many city yeah in only only Surabaya gasification the other city with uh, uh, incineration yeah like like incineration I think is uh, I can answer uh, more more yeah. detail in Indonesian language yeah <laughs> I'm sorry <laughs> okay no problem but I, I get the point that the the the, the barrier breaks basically. Uh, lies from the availability of the landfill and then the mm. social acceptance and then the, the last is the economic uh, feasibility or viability. Okay, I think the time is up. <laughs> it's already six minutes <laughs> off from the time. So uh, I would like to thank again the two speakers of today's uh, afternoon lecture series to uh, Dr. Faisal Ibrahim and Dr. Ari Bakhtiar Krishna Putra. And in brief, uh, just want to summarize that biomass and even waste uh, can be uh, useful to generate uh, an alternative fuels replacing the conventional or traditional fossil fuels like diesels, solar, or whatever. And uh, by using the current advanced technology, for example, the, the bioputhanol productions and waste to electric uh, gasification systems, we could uh, basically contribute right, to, to the engagement of the affordable and clean energy for all, as uh, mentioned in the seven of sustainable development goals. And I think that's all that I can talk about. And again, uh, thank you for the, the nice lecture given by Dr. Faisal Ibrahim and also Dr. Ari Bhakti at Krishna Putra. And, uh, and in this occasions, I would like to return uh, the, the sessions back to the uh, uh, Master of Ceremony uh, to Ms. Aulia, please. Okay, thank you very much for Associate Professor Faisal, Mr. Ari, and Dr. Ruri for the excellent lecture today. Please give applause to our speakers and moderator by using the Zoom reach feature. So furthermore, we would like to present a certificate awarding to our speaker and moderator today. The first one is the certificate for Associate Professor Faisal And the second one, the certificate. Okay. And the second one, the certificate for Mr. Harry. And the last one, the certificate for our moderator, Dr. Ruri.